Hello, welcome to Liberate 2021. This is a presentation about socially assisted robotics and how this field, which is about 20 years old, is developing technologies for user empowerment. Socially assisted robotics is a relatively new area of robotics, and it's one that's often counterintuitive to people because the physical robots are used not to do physical work for people, but rather to help people help themselves. So the idea is that even though the machines are physical, they're using social interaction and social support in order to help people to do their own physical work. This turns out to be necessary because while apps can give us monitoring, sort of from the idea of the quantified self, and a lot of assessment about behavior and behavioral state and even cognitive state, physiological state, and we can develop apps that coach, what turns out to still be necessary is some kind of continuous and personalized embodied social support, simply because that is how we as humans are wired. We're wired as social creatures, and so we respond most strongly and our behavior and our well being in the long run is most affected by physically embodied human social interaction or other types of social interaction that tap into our motivation and provide companionship and support for behavior change. So, really, the whole field of socially assisted robotics is structured around that human need, and it is designed to provide physical agents to fill the gaps where human support is not available. Now, what's really important here is to understand that the role of the robot is not as a toy or entertainment or as a social media tool. So this is not something that you can do by replacing it with a non-robot. The role of the robot is as a driver for behavior change through providing social motivation and reward in the physical world, in the physical co-present context. So the robot is, of course, a physically embodied agent. It is supportive, it is knowledgeable, and it plays a role of a peer or a buddy or a coach. It can play different types of roles, although it needs to pay, play a consistent role for the given user. But it really depends on the context, on the age of the user and the user's preferences, et cetera. For example, our work has shown that while uh, kids very much prefer buddies, older people might prefer coaches. The important features of a socially assisted robot are that it has agency, so it behaves contingently to the user and in response to the user, not in some kind of road fixed way. It is inherently motivating and rewarding so that the user actually wants to interact with the robot. It isn't just a nagging thing. The robot isn't just something there that nags, but it is something that the user goes out of their way to interact with, that there's intrinsic motivation and that it is a rewarding and enjoyable experience. And to make that happen, typically the robot needs to have some kind of character or personality. So it needs to have some consistent character that has predictability, and yet it cannot be so repeatable and predictable to be boring. So it needs to be a balance of predictability and novelty and surprise, which is what we expect from our human caregivers and companions as well. Now, this work in social assistive robotics has been happening across the world for the last two decades in numerous domains and with numerous positive results. So social assistive robotics has been developed and validated a great deal in the context of autism interventions and therapies, cognitive, social, and behavioral. There are more than 10,000 peer-reviewed papers of studies in autism alone. However, there have been a great number of other domains where social assistive robotics has also been developed and validated, including uh, work for at-risk infants, for assessment and intervention, for babies who are three to six months old, for K-12 special education, for students with special needs, for stroke and other types of neurorehabilitation, for cognitive support, for Alzheimer's and other types of dementia care, for type 2 diabetes mitigation and obesity mitigation. And of course, there has been quite a bit of work for uh, well elderly and K-12 education in general and other user populations as well. So just a very, very large body of work that has been accumulated. One good example uh, from our own work is work supported by the National Science Foundation. And there is a Science Nation video on the web uh, about this work. And this is in the context of autism. I will play just one minute of it or less just to give you a sense. And then this is found on the web at the link that's given right there. Meet Adrian, age six. This is some great work. And his robot friend, Kiwi. You are doing an amazing job. 
on this weekend morning, they've settled in to play some games, along with Big Brother Darren. Adrian is on the autism spectrum, and Kiwi is no toy. It's a socially assistive robot. You are doing really great. Keep up the good work. It's very important in this context that the robot is actually a physical robot and not just a screen. Note that the child already has a screen, but the screen does not provide the joint attention, the eye gaze, the turn taking, and all of the other social cues and opportunities to learn that often individuals on the spectrum um, do not get to practice with other peers. So it's just one example where the physical embodiment is critical and it's complementary with other technologies and of course with human caregivers and coaches and therapists. It's just a project that happened with four institutions in a very large data set. And it's an example of success, but it's also one of the rare examples of a large scale support to do a study. What really unfortunately is missing in this field and more broadly in human machine interaction, which is a tremendous field of potential support, is that we really have very little support for real world studies and data sets. And so most computing research uses just convenient data sets that people can readily get for free on the web. And those are usually with convenience populations, with unimodal data, like just video or just video and audio, and pretty much almost in unrealistic lab scenarios. So they're not collected in the wild. They're not collected in real schools, real homes, real hospitals, real therapy centers. And therefore, they're not really relevant to the real world. And this isn't necessarily by researcher choice because there's almost no funding for these in the world experiments and data collections for assistive technologies. And that's really a barrier to research because we need these data sets in order to develop actually meaningful machine learning algorithms in order to provide the technologies that people need. So if we look at the state of the art summary right now in 2021 of social assistive robotics, uh, there's a great deal of evidence, uh, literally, you know, we could say probably 100,000 peer reviewed papers across different domains that shows that it does work. Users across the age and ability spectrum, smile, pet, hug, engage with, accept, play with and learn from social assistive robots. They, they adhere to therapies, they form bonds, their stress levels are reduced, their skills are learned or relearned, socialization is increased, and health and learning outcomes are gained and sustained. So there's a tremendous body of evidence on efficacy, but it comes from numerous separate small-scale studies because, unfortunately, there's no bridge funding right now between these wonderful studies, largely NSF-supported, to clinical validation. So there are no significant NIH or other programs to do actual clinical trials to validate this and to scale it up. And that's unfortunate because on the other hand, in, on the commercialization end, uh, investors want to see clinical evidence in order to invest because this is not software, this is hardware. These are physical robots. And for them to be physical, well, that's a larger investment than just software. And because of that barrier, they want clinical efficacy. And so it's a dead end. It's a kind of a valley of death where we have tremendous promising early results and then no bridging to the next step that would help uh, tremendous numbers of user populations. And so just in closing, we know that social human robot interaction have tremendous potential to empower people, that it can be really a key part of personalized health and education, not just in the distant future, but right now. In fact, if we had had it when the pandemic started, the outcomes in terms of uh, isolation for both K-12 children and the elderly and many others would have been decreased. We know that these machines can enhance without replacing human experts and support. They can enhance care and education. We know that they already can enable complex interventions, therapies, and adherence to care regimens. We know that they can allow for continuous assessment and personalized support for individuals. And we know that they can empower individuals in order to be productive in this new spectrum of the future of work so that we're not looking at making human work automated and removing people from the loop, but instead empowering people across the ability spectrum. Thank you.